Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inizor Education. Um, we are continuing talking about electricity and uh, we basically start the new uh, chapter of this which is basically about electrical fields. Now my first lecture in this chapter is related to Coulomb's law. Coulomb's, Coulomb's different pronunciation but in any case that's obviously the name of the guy who um, basically invented this particular law he um, made some experiments etc and came with a nice formula which I'm going to talk about today now this lecture is part of the course called physics for teens presented on the website unizor.com um, I suggest you to watch this lecture from the website uh, because the website basically presents a course so this lecture is part of the whole set of lectures and there is a logical dependency be between the lectures there, is certain, um, there are certain thoughts about how to present this uh, uh, material plus the website has um, exercises, uh, problem solving, exams and other functionality um, Obviously, the lecture itself is linked to YouTube or whatever else, wherever you found this particular lecture. So that's why you can watch it from the uh, website exactly the same way. But again, the detailed notes for each lecture is on the website, so it's much more um, beneficial to use the website. And by the way, the site is completely free, there are no ads, there are no financial strings attached, etc. Okay, so we are talking about Coulomb's law. Um, first of all, um, we do know by now that electrical charge is basically excess or uh, deficiency of electrons relatively to protons in the object. So every atom in its neutral state um, has the same amount of protons and electrons. Protons in the nucleus and electrons are, well, we are considering this planetary model of atom when the electrons are rotating, circulating around the, the nucleus. Not exactly, maybe true how it is in nature, but that, that's a good enough model for us. But the number is the same, number of protons and number of electrons. If there is an axis of uh, electrons, we are saying that the object is negatively charged and use the sign minus. Obviously it's, you know, just sign. There is no negative or positive electricity, it's just our convenient model. Excess of electrons is the same as we are uh, uh, calling the, the negative charge. Now deficiency of electrons, when the number of electrons is less than the number of protons, we designate as a positive charge. Now what's important is, and again we were talking about this before, um, electrical uh, objects which are electrically charged do have certain forces among them. For instance, if you have two positively charged um, uh, objects, which means in both you have a deficiency of electrons, they will repel each other with certain force. Um, or negatively charged both, which is um, excess of electrons in both objects. They're also repelling. If you, however, have one object with positive charge and another with negative charge, so one is, has deficiency and another has excess of electrons, they do have the certain attracting force. Now, so numerous experiments were conducted to measure this force. And today I'm going about numerical a representation of this force. But before going to this, I would like to talk about the electrical field. Now, um, so far we have been familiar with one particular kind of field, which is gravitational field. So w w what is the field? Field is basically a certain uh, area of space where certain forces exist without basically uh, physical contact. So the gravity exists 
on, on, on a height of uh, 100 kilometers from the surface of the Earth. So Earth still gravitates the objects which are 100 kilometers from its surface. That's basically what we call the field. Again, this is just the terminology. Now, the same thing with electrical charges. They are on the distance from each other, and still they experience the force. One experiences the force of another, attracting or re repelling force. Which means that electric charge has certain electrical force around it. Let's call it the force field. So this electrical field or electrical force field, if you wish, is certain area of space where attracting or repelling electrical forces exist. Okay, now I think it's basically um, I it's time to, to go into the measurement of these forces. Let's think about it this way. Um, if you have let's say two electrons one electron and another electron now both are just electrons by themselves there are no protons which means this has a negative charge and this has a negative charge which is equal to the charge of one electron which is certain amount of certain units called coulombs by the way which we were talking about before so anyway, two negatively charged electrons. Let's put them in certain, uh, at certain distance from each other. Well, they will repel each other, right? Okay. Now, what if I will get two electrons here and still one electron there? The repelling force, of w w which we can measure actually, um, which this particular electron is experiencing, would be double the one which was before, right? So we can say that the force between these um, two objects, one object containing two electrons and another containing only one, it's twice as strong. The repelling force is twice as strong, right? Well, obviously, we will take n electrons here it will be n times as strong because the forces as vectors are adding to each other this is one object we are considering the small object obviously a point object so this is the point object with n electrons and this is the point object with one electron and the force between them a repelling force will be n times greater than one of them now if I have objects with m electrons here it will again increase in m times again obviously because each one of them has all these so if I will just add them up it will be m times greater so obviously if we are talking about two objects one has certain like n axis electrons and another has m axis electrons the force should be proportional to m times n, correct? Seems to be natural, because again, the forces are adding together. And there is one particular uh, value of force at this distance between two electrons. And then if I have m electrons here, here, and n electrons there, it's supposed to be multiplied by m and by n. So the force is proportional to the number of excess electrons in these two objects. Now, excess of electrons is basically a measure of electrical charge. Now, we measure electrical charge in coulombs. This is, again, the same guy who invented this law, obviously. So, and uh, there is a um, definition of what is the charge of one coulomb that's such a unit which for electron uh, I think it's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulomb if I'm not mistaken 
So this is the definition of Coulomb, because e electrons charge is very small, it's very difficult to measure anything. So they have invented another unit, Coulomb, defined it completely differently, but th again later on they have decided that the most convenient way to define this unit of electrical charge, Coulomb, in terms of electrons. So one electron has so much Coulombs in it, and that's the definition of the Coulomb. If you wish, you can say that one Coulomb is one electron charge, whatever one electron is, divided by 1.6 times 10 to the minus nineteen. Doesn't really matter. All right, so number of electrons, therefore, is proportional to the electrical charge measured in Coulombs. Because one electron has charge proportional to one coulomb. So it's all a matter of coefficient, right? So number of electrons here and number of electrons here are basically proportional to the charge of one object and the electrical charge of another object. So instead of proportionality to number of electrons, we can say that it's proportional to charges, where Q1 is electrical charge of one object proportional to the number of excess electrons. And this is the coefficient of proportionality. And Q2 is the electrical charge of another. Okay, so we got this particular proportionality purely logically. We never measure anything. Now, another thing. You understand that intuitively ob uh, obvious that if you will put these electrons at a further distance, well, the force must be weaker between them. Uh, attracting force or repelling force doesn't really matter. It must be weaker. Um, by how much? Well, here we will use the same logic which I was using when I was explaining the gravitational uh, field. Consider the following model. If you have two electrons or two objects, it doesn't really matter. This is one and this is another. Now, what is electrical force look like? Well, I can compare it to a little spring which goes between them. And the springs are emitted to all the direction from this object. And obviously from this object also. These are little springs. So every spring is a, some kind of a model of a force. So there is a spring between these two. All right? Now, how many springs Let's say there is certain finite number of springs which are originated in this particular thing. Now, this is an object. Now, the further I go, you see these springs and these springs, so these are actually going uh, and, and don't touch this object. So only these objects, these springs are touching these objects. So there is some kind of a um, cone, if you wish, which um, which is reaching this particular um, object. I'm not talking about point object, by the way. There are, there are certain dimensions, if you wish. Now, what is the dependency between force and, and the distance? Well, obviously, if you will take further, then you will have a little narrower cone, right? So the number of springs which actually hit this particular object is proportional to the density of these springs, right? How many per square inch or square meter or whatever, uh, square something, square linear uh, unit, uh, how many springs are falling into uh, a unit of, of area? Now, what is the area around this particular object, well, it's 4 pi r square, 
where R is the radius, right? So all these finite number of springs are, well, basically are spread around the spherical surface around this object. We are talking about three-dimensional uh, world, right? And so in three-dimensional world, all these springs are basically somehow reaching um, the whole surface. But the density would be obviously um, inversely proportional to the area of the entire surface. And the entire surface is proportional to r square, so the density would be inversely proportional to r square, where r is the distance. So that's why I put r square here. So if my force acts like these springs, then the number of these springs which are falling um, on the unit of uh, uh, area is inversely proportional to r square. Now, obviously, all these logical um, uh, statements are, are, are good, but it's necessary to confirm it with practical experiment. And this person probably was one of the first, but anyway, he was the one who formulated this type of a law. And, well, he basically measured the force, measured the, um, the charges, measured the distance, measured the force, and came up with this law, which right now can be with equal sign, where k is certain coefficient of proportionality, which definitely depends on the unit we are measuring this thing. So if this is a coulomb, and this is a coulomb, this is a square meter, this is Newton, then the k has certain uh, number, which is 9 to 10 to the 9th degree. And dimension would be uh, Newton divided by Coulomb square multiplied by meter square. Coulomb square would be in the um, numerator and here it's denominator so they cancel meter square meter square so we will have only newtons <coughs> which is the unit of measurement of the force. Okay now if this is positive and this is negative the force will be uh, attracting. If this is negative and negative or positive and positive the force will be repelling. And what's interesting is that since we are associating the sign negative or positive you can see that if two are positive or two are negative then this uh, product would be positive. So the force is positive for repelling and negative for attracting when these are of different signs plus minus or minus plus. Basically, that's all about this Poulon's law. Um, what is interesting is not only to understand this formula, but also kind of feel how it is um, numerically, how big it is. And uh, for this, I did some little calculations. I took two particular uh, objects one electron and another electron on a distance of one millimeter from each other. And using this formula I have calculated the force of repelling force. And the repelling force was 2.31 times 10 to the minus 22 Newton. Very small, right? Well, but look, electrons are too small. One electron has so much coulombs, you see, 10 to the minus 19. So, um, that's why the force is small. But now it's interesting to compare this force with the gravitational force between the same two electrons positioned at the same distance of one millimeter. And for this we will use Newton's uh, universal law of gravity, right? And that shows the result is 5.53 times 10 to the 
Well, brace yourself. Minus 65 Newton. You see how much smaller this is? It's like 43, 10 to the 43rd degree difference. All right? So, on the subatomic level of electrons, we can definitely ignore the gravitational force altogether. Now, when we are talking about planetary movements, well, the electrical charge in this case would probably be negligible because usually planets are electrically neutral. Number of protons and number of electrons are the same and, uh, I don't know, maybe as a result of historical, whatever, the world creation, I don't know. Um, it was basically neutral. But the masses are significant. And in these cases, in case of planets, it's the gravitational force which plays extremely uh, important role. But on a level of elementary particles, atoms and subatomic particles, it's the electrical forces which, uh, uh, which, which are predominant, where we just completely ignore the gravitational effects, or we can ignore. Because the difference is so much on uh, th this particular magnitude. Okay, um, that's it. I just wanted to introduce you to basically the main thing is this formula. And I was trying to um, present some kind of justification for this, not only the practical result, because if, you will, if you're given just the formula, you might say, okay, why? I mean, yes, experiments really kind of confirms it, but how did people come up with it? Well, these are the logic which I was just trying to convey to you uh, behind this formula. Okay, that's it. Thanks very much, and good luck.